Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute wherever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone. Uh, so Michael, thank you for joining us on The No Show podcast. I'm really pleased to have you. Um, happy to be here. No, it's, it's my pleasure, honestly. Um, so give us a bit about your background, because I know at the moment your research is really focused on sort of challenging acad academia and academics. Um, right. So, so what, what sort of drove you down this path? Okay, so um, this is sort of my second big research project. Uh, the first one that I started when I was still in, in grad school uh, was on uh, the moral sentiments, as they were called in the 18th century. So it was an era when uh, George W. Bush was com com uh, claiming to be a compassionate conservative, when Bill Clinton was talking about feeling your pain. Uh, and I thought that there was a problem in political philosophy uh, that under the influence of, of Kant in particular, too many people thought that even if uh, politics is highly emotional, it ought not to be. Uh, that there's something going wrong when um, people are uh, bringing their full psyche, including all their messy emotions, including their ability, uh, the ability of these emotions to spread from one person to another through some form of emotional contagion or some more active form of sympathy or empathy. Uh, they thought something was going wrong when politics worked this way. Um, and I, I didn't think something went wrong when politics worked this way. And so I tried to, to, to push as best I could uh, political philosophy, which at the time was dominated by John Rawls, a uh, very influential uh, Kantian working out of Harvard. Uh, I was trying to push it in a direction closer to Kant's great rival in, uh, in philosophy, the, the Scotch philosopher David Hume, who argued in the 18th century that reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions. Uh, not only is, but ought only to be. Uh, so I, I wrote my doctoral dissertation on that. I wrote a book, The Enlightenment of Sympathy, Justice, and the Moral Sentiments in the 18th Century and Today. And as I was going around promoting that book, uh, I noticed that since I was using historical texts, historical ideas, ideas from the 18th century, and trying to use them today, uh, there were all sorts of uh, different uh, objections to that, that often took the view uh, of what in the, the Germanic academic tradition are called Methodenstreiten, methods wars. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there were the analytic philosophers who thought, why are you reading these old books? You should just be looking at the most cutting edge uh, philosophical research. There are historians, uh, many of them of the so-called Cambridge School, the students and the students of the students of Quentin Skinner, who dominated the history of political thought at Cambridge for many years. And, and they are opposed to what they call antiquarianism. And, and they said, why are you attempting to use these old books in ways that are politically and philosophically valuable today? You're, 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 uh, you're, they're, they're, I, I misspoke. They they aren't antiquarians. They're accused of being anti. They're accused of being antiquarians. They're opposed to what they call anachronism, right? So if you're using an 18th century idea in a 20th or 21st century context, you're committing anachronism. You're wrenching it out of its mm -hmm. context. You're doing bad history. Is essentially what you're doing. So I was getting it from all sides, basically. The philosophers didn't like what I was doing. The historians didn't like what I was doing. My fellow political theorists and politics departments were often loyal to either the philosophical or the historical camp. And I looked at all this methodenstreiten all around me, and I said, what is going on? What are, why are we getting so mad at each other? What are we really arguing about? And it occurred to me that uh, the reason why 
these methodological arguments in the academy are so often so heated is because they're really ethical and political arguments. Mm -hmm. they're, they're ethical and political arguments about our ethical and political role in society as scholars, as academics. Um, so the first uh, paper on this topic that I wrote uh, was on the ethics of interpretation in political theory and intellectual history, where I looked at this debate uh, that I was then having between political theorists who read an old text like uh, Machiavelli or Hume or Kant or what have you, uh, and ask, how can we use this to inform some live political philosophical issue today? And then on the other hand, the historians, especially those of the Cambridge School, who were saying the only way to understand uh, works in the history of political thought is to situate them within their historical context. And these two sides can get very heated the, the, like I said, the political theorists call the historians antiquarians and see them as doing pointless, dusty work in the archive that never does anyone any good. The um, historians call the political theorists anachronists or presentists and say that they're uh, playing a pack of tricks on the dead, that they're uh, doing shoddy scholarship, that they're violating. Uh, often it's related to this uh, activism versus objectivity thing. They say that in the name of a political cause, they're doing violence to history. Okay. Right? So this is a debate I was very much a part of, and it was the first one where I saw, okay, ethics can help settle this debate. Moral philosophy can help settle this debate. And then once I did that for that one debate I was a part of, I realized, hey, this generalizes. And so many of the so-called methodological debates in the academy really are ethical and political debates. So can I just go back to the sort of the argument on both sides and, and just to unpack that a little bit more. Um, why, is it, why is it a problem if you take, for example, a text like Machiavelli, which is, you know, like famously, um, I think he was um, a, a labor peer who distributed it amongst all the, all Tony Blair's, um, cabinet why why would using a text like that it in, in in current times be you know missituating the text right so the the i mean sometimes the argument that the the cambridge school makes is that um you can use a text however you want you know you can use it to prop up your computer screen or to solve the current toilet paper crisis, or you know, you can use a book however you want to, but don't call what you're doing history. Certainly, and I might be willing to grant them that word. Maybe what I do isn't history, and that's fine. But they also sometimes say, don't claim that you understand the text. Don't claim that when you're using Machiavelli to try to figure out how to defend the Iraq war or whatever it is Blair's cabinet was using it for. Don't think for a moment that you're actually understanding what Machiavelli said. Because Machiavelli, as someone living in Renaissance Florence, could only mean uh, in his text the kind of uh, meaning that was available to someone living in Renaissance Florence. Mm -hmm. And um, Skinner uh, wrote at one point that asking uh, whether Machiavelli was right in some sort of timeless way, uh, specifically he said this in the 80s in a famous essay in, uh, of the 80s, uh, whether Machiavelli was right in a way that we should still care about for our politics today, when he said mercenaries are always a threat to liberty. Skinner said, well, that's like asking, is the king of France bald? meaning the current king of France, meaning there is no current king of France, mm -hmm. meaning that at least mercenaries, as Machiavelli understood them, didn't exist in 1986. Now, the fascinating thing here is that some group of people who can legitimately be called mercenaries didn't exist in 1986, but they did exist in 1988. Mm -hmm. That's the year that uh, 
former members of the South African uh, apartheid era white military founded a company that they called Executive Outcomes, which was the first modern private military contractor. Uh, and after them came Blackwater, came all these other uh, mercenary companies, companies that I think can legitimately be called mercenaries. Now, it may be that the mercenaries fighting for money in, um, the, um, in, in the wars of Renaissance Italy are in important ways different from the private military contractors fighting the wars uh, in, in Afghanistan and Iraq today, but they might be relevantly similar. Mm -hmm. And I think historians who are always trying to uh, advance their expertise by saying, you can't understand the past unless you've spent as much time in the archive as I have, because the past is a foreign country, the past is a distant place that's, that's so different from what we have now. Historians have a tendency for professional uh, interest reasons to exaggerate the difference between the past and the present. Mm -hmm. um, and I think political theorists may also have a tendency, because we're always trying to be relevant, mm -hmm. uh, may have a tendency to minimize the differences between the past and the present. Uh, but what the real similarities and differences are is an open question. It's not one where the historian's tendency is always right or the political theorist tendency is always right. It's a question we have to explore. It's, it's in many ways a work of translation. So we study uh, not just the mercenaries of Machiavelli's day, but also the private military contractors of our own. Uh, I myself haven't done that, but I've sent, read some fascinating books that have. And we ask, to what extent is Machiavelli's claim that mercenaries are always a threat to liberty? To what extent is that true of our mercenaries? Mm -hmm. So can Machiavelli help us better understand our mercenaries? And we have to be careful. I think if you just hand out copies of Machiavelli to MPs deciding whether or not to hire a private military contractor, they could easily be led astray by that. Mm -hmm. But if you're careful about it, I think that can be a really valuable enterprise to engage in and one that's genuinely providing a service to those trying to make political decisions today. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, you sort of, you, uh, as you described it, you sort of got um, attacks. I don't know, don't, let me not describe it as attacks, but critique from- Critique, from, we critique, we don't attack yeah. as academics. Yeah, um, from, from different, different sides. Um, and so, Based on that critique, how did that sort of shape the direction that you went in with your research? Right. So I still, I still do want to combine uh, historical and philosophical analytic methods. Uh, so in my current project on the ethics of the academy, uh, Max Weber, uh, the uh, turn of the 20th century uh, founder of sociology in many respects, um, plays a, a role roughly equivalent to the role that, that Hume played in my first project. Um, but a lot of my current work, which really is much more focused on getting the professional ethics of the academy right, rather than getting the interpretation of Faber right, um, is, is really trying to engage uh, with my fellow academics in uh, explicit argument about our professional ethics and the politics of our profession, rather than uh, letting those methodological disputes uh, play a subsidiary role. So I figured if so much of the talk about my first project seems to be taking the form of these disciplinary uh, battles, these methodological debates, these methoden striking, let's foreground those rather than backgrounding those. And let's do our best to, to try to figure out what the real uh, ethical values at stake here are, what the genuine political matters at stake here are. And um, that also has meant generalizing quite a bit, right? So I've, I've been reading a lot about how, you know, so my own 
previous work was at the intersection of uh, the history of political thought, political theory, and moral philosophy. Um, now uh, I'm looking at things like causal and interpretive social science, which is not something I myself have done very much, but trying to understand how the ethics of the humanities and social sciences works more generally, how the politics of the humanities and social sciences works more generally, so that hopefully my current project will be something that'll be of interest, not just to sort of my closest colleagues in fields closest to my own, but will be of more general use uh, both to academics throughout the humanities and social sciences who are concerned about doing the right thing, uh, both morally and politically, and members of the general public who uh, it seems increasingly uh, are concerned about the ethics and politics of the university and that that's an that's a issue that is uh, being very hotly debated right now uh, and has become one of the issues that divides the right and the left. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, your, your approach seems, I mean, from the beginning, seems very interdisciplinary because you sort of look at ideas from different places. And now you sort of got to the research where it's, I mean, it's really become uh, something that's in the public eye a lot, especially after like, um, you know, like things like Brexit and, and, and Trump coming into power. And there was like this really aggressive debate that's constantly happening about, you know, whether institutions are, are sort of, um, are mainly creating a, a generation of leftists or whether, and the right are, are opposed to this. So where do you find your sort of research um, in this world, in this sort of environment, where do you find your research going? Is it still in the interdisciplinary or do you, are you sort of going deeper into the, the, the politics of it all? Right. So um, I definitely do think that the only way to answer big questions like what should the professional ethics of an academic be, the only way to answer those questions effectively is to draw on every resource available. So that means if someone 100 years ago had something really good to say on the topic, like Max Weber certainly did, you have to draw on intellectual history. Uh, if there's empirical research, statistical studies, experimental studies in psychology or sociology or political science that are relevant to the question, you have to read those. Um, and and being, being interdisciplinary is, is tough. Um, I think it's, it's in some ways, uh, I'm my own discipline, so my, my, my PhD is in politics, is, is an inherently interdisciplinary one. Uh, politics is much more uh, a, a subject matter than it is a method or a discipline. And there are political scientists who use uh, basically economic methods, there are ones who use basically psychological methods, there are ones who use, you know, laboratory type psychology experiments. Uh, there are those who use statistical methods. There are those who use historical or anthropological methods. And of course, the stream I was um, brought up in was the one that uses philosophical methods. So sort of the, the school uh, of, of, of John Rawls and Robert Nozick and Jewish Sklar and Michael Walzer, uh, who were all at, you know, at Harvard in the, in the 60s and 70s and, and sort of created political theory as we know it today and as an inherently interdisciplinary exercise. Uh, that said, although I, I have my sort of political theorists behind me who are a, a, a discipline of interdisciplinarians, uh, it's still tough when you're encroaching on areas that uh, people have a sense of ownership in, in mm -hmm. other disciplines. Uh, and there's so much pressure right now uh, from outside the academy to increase interdisciplinary research because we know that's where the, the real gains are to be made. But at the same time, there are so many structural pressures to align yourself narrowly with a particular discipline uh, that it can, be, it can be very difficult to resist those. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I mean, at the beginning, just before we started recording, you and I sort of di discussed briefly how you're really trying to challenge academics into sort of making their, mm -hmm. 
into making their, their research sort of um, beyond the ac academy and, and outside and, and, you know, reach people in general. So first of all, what were you doing uh, sort of, uh, how are you trying to challenge academics? Right. So the current project in many ways stems from the fact that I was sad that uh, primarily only academics, uh, I mean, some members of the general public, but mostly academics only write for other academics. And yet we also want to change things. So maybe the way to do that is to begin by changing our fellow academics. So a book on uh, business ethics or legal ethics might be read uh, by some business people or lawyers or something. Uh, but I was hoping that uh, a book on academic ethics, which I have yet to write, I've written a bunch of articles, but the book hasn't emerged yet, will be read um, by a wide variety of academics who are in the habit of reading academic books anyway. So they might as well read them, read one that helps with their professional ethics. But at the same time, I think a large part of the lesson I learned in conducting this project is that what is the purpose of our profession? Well, obviously teaching plays an important role, teaching undergraduates, teaching graduate students. But I think the, the research we do um, is in many ways a form of teaching as well. We teach our readers. And if those readers are only other academics, then we're only teaching other academics, which is fine. They're human beings. They need to be taught things too. But if we do try to reach out to the general public, then our work becomes much more valuable. And I think in the public culture right now, when there are so many sources of disinformation uh, and foolishness zooming around the internet, uh, the idea that uh, we need, as a, as a matter of professional ethical responsibility, to do things like this and have one of the many, many videos flying around the internet not be filled with lunatic conspiracy theories, but filled with academics actually discussing ideas in a serious way. Uh, I, I think that that's not just something that is uh, sort of instrumentally valuable in that it might get more people to, to buy our books or cite our articles. It's not just promotion. It's actually doing something that helps justify our claim on scarce social resources uh, helps justify our existence as, as, as providing some form of useful service to the wider society. So uh, thank you for helping me fulfill my ethical responsibility. No, I, I mean, the pleasure, the pleasure is mine, honestly. And, and I, like, like yourself, I, I truly believe that there is a fundamental need to, to have the voices of academics, you know, to, to sort of, balance out the the sort of voices that are online that are, are really divisive and and that are you know come from a, a place of purely opinion without the, the right although sometimes i mean sometimes those people are academics i mean i don't want to be you know so so i have uh, probably the loudest voice on, on the internet uh from an academic background is like jordan peterson and mm -hmm. he is an academically trained psychologist. Um, and I kind of identify with him sometimes because we were both denied tenure at Harvard. And um, he, I find being denied tenure at Harvard can drive people off the deep end. And I'm trying very hard to hold on to my sanity and not become Jordan mm -hmm. Peterson. Uh, but he, when he went to Toronto, rather than continuing to do respectable psychological experimental research, he started going off uh, into these weird misogynist mythologies mm -hmm. and, and sort of the Carl Jung, uh, who had always been something of an influence on him. Uh, the worst aspects of Jung became what he's popularizing on the internet today. So it's not as if having a PhD and having a university appointment guarantee that you won't be one of these merchants of, of madness on the internet. You very well could be, you know, a, a respectable academic who spreads crazy conspiracy theories. Uh, and, but the nice thing about academia is it does have structures of accountability, yeah. right? So there, there's peer review, 
there are uh, hiring and promotion review boards, and they don't work perfectly. They're often very political uh, in, uh, in, a, in a pejorative sense, in, in being about what's fashionable rather than being about what's well argued or well researched. Uh, but unlike the internet, where the incentive structure is entirely about uh, holding eyeballs rather than producing good ideas, the academy, although deeply imperfect, contains at least some incentives that encourage you to think rationally and critically rather than conspiratorially and, 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 and madly. And, and also, I'd, I'd add that, I mean, having spoken to, to, to a bunch of academics since I've started doing this work, um, I also would add that the academics are, are generally grounded in principle. They, they're not people who, they, they don't have nothing to gain from, you know, coming up with a controversial idea because fundamentally their, their research is to further the, the field that they're in. And the problem that I've seen with somebody like Jordan Peterson, who is, you know, has some, some fantastic ideas and has some, you know, lots of like value added. The, the issue I found with him is that the sort of popularity began to shape how he, as opposed to the thinking shaping the audience. Right, right. And that you can see why that's so tempting. I mean, I don't know if I could do what he does because I, I think I probably lack lack the charisma or whatever special I, I sauce he has that has no. that has made him. But but I wouldn't like. There's the devil on my shoulder saying, you know, you can become famous. But um, if if that's what you're pursuing, and of course it's not Jordan Peterson as an individual; it's the algorithms, mm -hmm. right? It it it's that's that's what. Facebook and YouTube promote are the things that hold the eyeballs, that hold the attention, not the things that are actually well done. Um, and, and that means that if you internalize those algorithms, if you're watching your viewership numbers go up at your Jordan Peterson and you're watching them go up exponentially and you see what gets the eyeballs and you see what doesn't, and then you have this really strong incentive to, to follow uh, the algorithm rather than following the evidence. Um, and, and that can produce all sorts of, of uh, distortions where someone who, who, who may have some really good ideas uh, ends up presenting things in a way that does real social harm. Uh, in a way that those algorithms have done so much harm to our, our society and politics more generally. So, so if we don't use money and fame to incentivize academics to come into the public domain, how do we incentivize them to come and come out and speak? About right. So, so this is, this is a huge issue of what are the incentives in academia, right? Because uh, it's not as if the dominant incentive in academia is so pure that these are people with a, with a, a pure love of knowledge uh, and that academia is an ideal institution for promoting that. I, I think the main incentive in academia isn't money or fame, it's prestige. Mm -hmm. it, it's getting to the higher in the, in the league tables, moving from a lower ranked university to a higher one, from a lower ranked university press for your book to a higher ranked university press, right? So the, the, the primary compensation in academia uh, is, 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 is an esteem economy, a prestige economy. And that kind of incentive, although it can, it, it may be better in some ways than the, than the fame or the money economy, the esteem economy, um, it, it's just as much a, a corruptible incentive. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a great book out. Um, I'm trying to, it's on my bookshelf here. I'm looking for the title. It's a, a woman who was in, um, grad school with me named Zena Hitz, H-I-T-Z. Uh, and she wrote a book about uh, Lost in Thought. That's the name of the book, Lost in Thought. I see it on my bookshelf. Um, and it, it's about how dropping out of that prestige rat race, which all of us trained in the Ivies, uh, were, were socialized to try to enter into, where we looked down on those who pursued money or fame, but we looked up at those who pursued 
more prestigious appointments, more prestigious presses and so on. Dropping out of that, and she left uh, a prestigious research university to teach at uh, St. John's College, which is this great books liberal arts college in, in the US that, that emphasizes uh, teaching over research and teaching uh, classic texts over teaching fashionable ideas. Um, and she talks about how she had to reform herself to get over that esteem addiction, mm -hmm. which is very similar uh, in its structures to the money addictions or fame addictions that motivate other people. Um, and she had to get over that in order to recommit herself to the love of thinking for its own sake. Uh, now, the, the, the problem, I think, with that book, and, and it, it, it's a very touching combination of philosophy and memoir. Um, the problem with that book is her recommitment to ideas for its own sake coincided with her conversion to Catholicism, which, you know, I'm not going to criticize her for finding faith since we used to hang out. That's her, that's her soul at stake, not mine. But it means her solution doesn't work for everyone, mm -hmm. right? So, so if you're a person of faith and you're committed that the things that are genuinely good are the things that God looks on with favor uh, and that you are following the right path when you pursue those things that are genuinely good, that's a really good way to strengthen your commitment. Um, whereas if you think, yes, of course, knowledge is valuable for its own sake, but ooh, that prestige, if that's what you're addicted to, or that money or fame, if that's what you're addicted to, or that popularity, uh, if that's what you're addicted to, or that rush of righteousness, mm -hmm. which I think a lot of scholar activists are motivated uh, by, not by the incentive of doing real good in the world, but by the incentive of getting that little rush of self-righteousness that you get when you virtue signal. Uh, so, you know, like I said, my own addiction is to the esteem one, uh, the prestige one, but I see all these other addictions that people have. Overcoming those temptations, when you see them as sinful in the eyes of God, uh, is doable, is practicable in a way that is harder for those of us who aren't people of faith. Uh, so as much as I admire her as an individual and admire her book as an intervention into the philosophy of the academy, um, I don't think her solutions are generalizable mm -hmm. outside her faith community, which is unfortunate because, uh, you know, the, it, there's a, a, a trend among um, atheist philosophers of the 20th century to sort of miss religion. You know, first Nietzsche was all excited that God was dead. And then Heidegger bemoaned, oh, only a God can save us. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm very happy for, for my old friend Zina that a God saved her. And mm -hmm. I, I sometimes wish a God could save me from my own <laughs> esteem addictions uh, and my other compulsions. Uh, but uh, it, it, is, it, it is a tough thing to do to commit yourself to the love of something good for its own sake, be that knowledge or anything else that's good for its own sake. Well, that's a that's a really really um, powerful point. Um, where can people uh, sort of follow you or keep up with you online? Okay, so uh, you can follow me on Twitter at mfraser78 m f r a z e r 78. Uh, I post all my recent research there. Um, I have a website by UEA that also uh, posts all my uh, research. Uh, just Google Michael Fraser UEA. Uh, if you look up my Google Scholar profile at Google Scholar, that'll give you all my, uh, all my articles and books. Um, and, uh, you know, there are, there, there are a number of Michael Frasers in the world. Um, yeah. If you just Google Michael Fraser, you'll end up with uh, uh, a, a, an Irish drug dealer who was <laughs> repeatedly targeted by the Irish mafia for death and somehow keeps escaping... Uh, <laughs> being murdered very closely. He's one of the most uh, attempted murdered people that there is. So uh, Michael L. Fraser is the name I usually publish under to avoid uh, confusion with him. There's also the protagonist of a, of a gay pornographic novel, uh, for better or for worse. So Google Michael L. Fraser, UEA. 
Yeah. I, I mean, I will link all of that anyway, just to save that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but Michael, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Um, where, where um, I mean, what kind of advice would you give to sort of um, young academics or young um, sort of people thinking to get into academia? What kind of advice would you would you give? Oh, that's tough. Uh, so a Weber, who I've mentioned already, uh, gives the advice from Dante, abandon all hope, ye who enter here. Uh, I, I would hate to give that advice. Uh, but the fact is, right now, um, academia, especially the humanities, is in a state of contraction. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to get a permanent job. Mm -hmm. And you might find that jumping through the hoops that you need to jump through in order to get a permanent job distort your, um, your soul sufficiently that once you have it, you can't even make use of it because your love of learning has been killed. Uh, so that's a grim thought, but an even grimmer thought is what are the alternatives, right? So if, if you see a way forward where you can build a materially sustainable life for yourself, doing something you enjoy, uh, while keeping your mind alive, avocationally, while keeping your mind alive in your free time, uh, go ahead and pursue that. But if there is no alternative path that you see available to you, uh, the way to evaluate the, the potential of an academic career uh, is to ask, uh, is this path uh, better or worse than the other paths that are realistically available to me? And if you can make it work, uh, so there's a, there's a book out of a very cynical advice to a young academic by uh, a guy who was a postdoc with named Jason Brennan called Nice Work If You Can Get It. Um, and uh, it is true that it's nice work if you can get it. Uh, but if in the process of getting it, you destroy your love of the work, then it's probably not worth getting mm -hmm. at all. Um, so... Uh, I'd recommend reading uh, sort of the two diametric uh, opposed books that came out recently. Uh, Zena's book, uh, Lost in Thought, the ultimate non-cynical uh, approach to the life of the mind versus Jason Brennan's nice work, if you can get it, the ultimate cynical approach to the life of the mind. Uh, and if you can somehow square uh, what those two books are saying and hold that contradiction within your own heart, uh, and navigate that successfully, then I think you might be, you might be uh, able to manage an academic career. Of course, the classic thing you should read is Max Weber's uh, essay, usually translated as science as a vocation, uh, but that's a mistranslation of the German Wissenschaft, which means scholarship and mm -hmm. includes the humanities. Uh, Geisteswissenschaften are the humanities, the spirit sciences. Um, and most of Weber's examples are actually from the humanities, not from not from science, but it's translated, it's known as science as a vocation. So that's the, that's the classic thing to read. And that's where he says, abandon all hope ye who enter here. Excellent. Well, I mean, even though it's, even though it's quite daunting advice, um, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's real in nature because of the, you know, the, you know, the fact that, like you said, um, the humanities are in, the, the social sciences are in contraction and, and it doesn't help that we've just had, you know, what, the worst pandemic that's happened in a long, long time. So yeah. um, these things all play into it. Um, but right. But I mean, the, the, the nice thing about the pandemic, and how many sentences begin that way, is that it's gotten rid of all jobs, right? It's, <laughs> not, it's not as if it's gotten rid of a higher proportion of academic jobs that it has gotten rid of jobs in the, in the, the restaurant or tourism industries, <laughs> you know, so it... I, I know I have a lot of former students um, who end up, you know, uh, bartending or uh, running restaurants or what have you around Norwich. Uh, but now all the restaurants and bars are closed, so you might as well get a PhD. You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, fingers crossed that things will open up and, and you know, people, people do get the jobs they want. But um, I, I, do, I do really appreciate the advice, and I think it's really... Um, it's really telling because it, 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 it sort of gives that real element that, the, that people oftentimes sort of don't want to hear. And I think, I think you've done just, just that. So yeah, well, I, again, I think in, in some ways academia operates like a pyramid scheme. I mean, everyone's trying to recruit PhD students 
and but there are so many more PhD students than there are entry level jobs, and there are so many more uh, entry level jobs than there are senior jobs, and. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if I'll ever write on this, but I do think it's ethically irresponsible to encourage, I mean, the nice thing about a PhD is that it can have non-academic uses, uh, but uh, it's, I think it's ethically irresponsible to encourage people to join a profession that right now doesn't really have room for many more people. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. Um, uh, on that note, Michael, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, and I'm, I wish we could have ended on a happier note. Yeah, uh, but I mean, it's still, it's still a useful note. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully it will save someone's life if they're watching this. Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute wherever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion and I'll make sure I get back to everyone.